And I'm going to ask you to hang with me a bit. may be familiar with our core congregation, our core members, but maybe not necessarily for some. And so, as the Lord was dealing with me in terms of what to bring forth today, he centered me on this, and I said, Lord, well, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm cool if, if you want me to roll with this, but there must be something specific that you have in mind, and I, and I need to know what that is. And uh, I had to read it a couple of times to kind of feel out where he is going, sense where he's going with this. The text reads, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, uh, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple <laughs> at Damascus named Ananias. And unto him said he, the Lord, in a vision, and Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about this guy by many of the, this man, how evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go that way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the into the house and putting his hands on him saith brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest had sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized and when he had received meat now he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were in Jerusalem. I want to speak on this subject. Learning subtraction. I, I, I want to speak on this subject. Learning subtraction. Learning subtraction. That's correct. Subtraction. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I am before you now. Uh, you have given me this thought, and I feel that is solidified in my spirit. Help me now to bring it forth to your people. May it minister, may it encourage, may it help them to grow thereby. We pray that you would hold everything that would try to hinder uh, ultimately your purpose in this service. We bind, we bind, we bind, we take authority over demonic influences, insignificant movements, insignificant distractions now. We bind it and we take authority over it. This is spiritual ground. This is spiritual ground. And I, I call everything that will try to disrupt this atmosphere. Mm. 
uh, to be discharged even now. Thank you for the ground that we are on. And may you have full course in this service, I humbly ask of thee. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated, learning subtraction. The great composer Ludwig van Beethoven lived much of his life in fear of deafness. He was concerned because he felt the sense of hearing was essential to creating music of lasting value. When Beethoven discovered that the thing he feared most was coming rapidly upon him, he was almost frantic with anxiety. He consulted doctors and tried every possible remedy that he could find, but the deafness, the deafness increased until at last all hearing was now gone. Beethoven finally found the strength he needed to go on despite his great loss. To everyone's amazement, to everyone's bewilderment, he wrote some of his grandest music after he had become totally deaf. With all distractions shut out, melodies flooded in on him as fast as his pen could write them down. His deafness became a great asset. His deafness became a great asset. Touch the person beside you and ask them, can you use your advantage, your disadvantage, rather to your advantage? Ask them, can you use your disadvantage to your advantage? Well, I don't see nobody saying nothing up in here this morning. I hope I'm in the right church. <laughs> can you use your disadvantage? To your advantage. In our text, we are reminded, and also uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, there is a reminder of Saul's persecution of the church. It says in Acts 8 and 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house dragging out men and women and committing them to prison. Based on our text now, Saul was not satisfied with the results of his campaign in Jerusalem and was still anxious to do more work. He was still anxious uh, to still continue persecuting Christians. Many Christians at this time had fled from Jerusalem and Saul uh, was determined to pursue them and bring them back as prisoners to Jerusalem. The Bible lets us know that he sought authorization from the high priest to go into the Jewish communities and to continue his persecution of the church. However, as Saul was heading towards Damascus, he was stopped in his tracks. And without any warning, he found himself surrounded by a bright light. That bright light was the expression of God's divine glory. Uh, that bright light that shone from heaven was an expression of God's divine glory. And since no man can see God's glory, it is not surprising that the effects of that bright light caused Saul to have temporary blindness. <laughs> now, in the midst of that bright light, uh, Saul heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When Saul heard the voice, he said, Who art thou? Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said unto him, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The voice that Saul heard speaks now to divine revelation. <laughs> we have divine glory, and now we have divine revelation. I want you to understand that in this divine revelation, it's Jesus that is speaking to Saul after his ascension. And he's letting Saul know that it wasn't just the church that he was persecuting, but himself as well. 
The experience left Saul trembling. <laughs> the experience left Saul astonished and asking the Lord, what will thou have me to do? Saul was told by the Lord to go into the city and he will be told what to do. And so those that traveled with him led Saul by the hand now to Damascus. Ask the person beside you, has God ever left you hanging? Yeah, don't look at me. Ask the person beside you, has God ever left you hanging? I mean, it's one thing when your friends leave you hanging. Uh, it's, it's one thing when your, your family member leaves you hanging. I mean, it's, it, it's one thing when your, your family member or work colleagues leave you hanging. It could be that they are unreliable. It could be that they are selfish. It could be that they are irresponsible and to avoid being hurt, to avoid being let down and frustrated and left hanging again, you have decided not to rely on them. You have decided not to make any future or further plans with them. Now, that's how some of us would perhaps treat a family member. That's how perhaps some of us would, would treat a friend or a work colleague. But, but, but when it comes to God now, if God leaves you hanging like we see with Saul, uh, uh, who is blind, who is confused and, and being led where he knows not, that's a different story. If God leaves you hanging, that's a different story. We know that God is everywhere. We know that God is omnipresent. We know that he, he clo he's as close as the mention of his name. And if we call out and if we cry out, the Bible says that God will answer and come to our rescue. But what happens when you're expecting God to come through for you and he doesn't? What happens when you're expecting God to come through for you and he doesn't? What happens when you're expecting God to be somewhere and he doesn't show up? When you hit rock bottom and, and you're at your worst and you, you need to see God's best and you can't see it. What happens when you're, you're left alone, when you're left broken and helpless and suffering and God doesn't come? But the questions come. The questions come. Questions such as, where is God? Why is God not helping me? Did God forget about me? What have I done to deserve what I'm going through? Why do bad things seem to be happening to me all the time? Sometimes it can feel as if God has backed out of the relationship with you. My God. Because you're not seeing him do anything concerning your situation. While on the cross, it was Jesus who cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It seemed that Jesus was left hanging. It seemed as if God had forgotten his son on the cross. But the Bible lets us know that God is never inactive. God is never inactive. He's always working, and God is in control of every situation that we're dealing with or confronted with. The Bible lets us know that God works all things uh, according to the counsel, after the counsel of his will. Uh, the text is letting us know that God acts rationally. He has a reason for what he does. He chooses a purpose and he acts to fulfill that particular purpose. When it feels like God has forsaken you, when you're wondering if he cares about you, even if you can't see the hand of God in your situation, remind yourself that God is working. Remind yourself that God is working. Even if it doesn't feel like it, remind yourself that God is working. Even when the rent is due, even when the fridge is empty, even when there's no gas in the car, remind yourself that God is working. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Touch somebody beside you and say, God is working in your situation. 
Oh, come on, touch him again. Shake him, if you will, and say, God is working in your situation. You don't have to see it to know that he's working. You just have to know. You just have to believe. You just have to have faith that God is working. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like. It doesn't matter how dark it gets. It doesn't matter how cloudy it gets. It doesn't matter who's saying what they're saying, what they're saying, for the sake of saying what they're saying, to say what they need to say. God is still working. Woo, touch somebody and say, I know God is still working. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. Uh, you can tell me everything that you want to tell me, but you are a liar because I know that my God is still working. I know in whom I believe, uh, and I am persuaded. I am persuaded that God is still working. So go ahead and slam the door in my face. Go ahead and drop me from the committee. Go ahead and say all manner of things against me. But I still know that my God is still working things out. Things may look crooked right now, but God is still working. Things may look rough right now, but God is still working. I may have to climb some hills, but God is working. I may have to go down some valleys, but God is still working. I may have to go through some tough situations, but I know that God is still working. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. You may be seated. The Bible lets us know. The Bible lets us know that while in Damascus, Saul fasted for three days. No doubt, Saul was still in shock and probably sorrowful over the enormity of his actions as the weight of his past now rested upon him. Saul, who was once a ferocious persecutor of the church, is now left in shambles and waiting on God. He's waiting on God. As the Lord was preparing for that next stage with Saul, and this is now where I wanna, what I really want to hang my head on, as God was preparing that next stage with Saul, a disciple by the name of Ananias. Let the church say Ananias. Ananias. I'll say it a second time. Ananias. And say it a third time. This is the character that I want to focus on. <laughs> the Lord comes to Ananias in a dream. And the Lord tells Ananias to go to the house of Judas and ask for the one called Saul of Tarsus. For he is praying and it's seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. No, I need you to understand that the visit was not unexpected. It was not unexpected because the Bible's letting us know that Saul was expecting Ananias. <laughs> Saul was expecting Ananias. But you need to understand in the text that, 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 that Ananias was in a hurry. Ananias was not in any hurry. I need you to understand that within the text, we're looking at what is called for this hookup, we're looking at what is called divine arrangements. And, and, and God orchestrated a divine arrangement as it relates now to Saul and Ananias through a double vision. So Ananias gets the dream, but Saul also gets the dream, and Saul is, always, is also waiting for the confirmation of the dream. I wonder how many times our blessings are waiting on us. I wonder how many times our breakthroughs are waiting on us, <laughs> expecting us, but, but, but like Ananias, I don't want to go too far in my text. <sighs> we're, we're hesitant. Divine arrangement speaks to a specific method or rule by which God works. And no demon, no outside force can destroy it or disrupt it. I need you to understand that it is established supernaturally by God. Elijah, through divine arrangements, was fed by a raven by a raven at a brook because God directed the raven to supply food. For Elijah, divine arrangements. The Bible lets us know 
that at one time us Gentiles were far from God and we were lost and sinful and needing to be saved. And it was God who orchestrated a divine arrangement between Cornelius and Peter, also in a double vision. God arranged a divine, a divine appointment for the two of them to come together to bring us Gentiles closer to him. And so Cornelius becomes the first Gentile to hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ and was baptized through divine arrangements. God will use divine arrangements, catch this now, God will use divine arrangements to reset, to rearrange, and to readjust us and our lives so that we can be where he wants us to be. Let me say that again. God will use divine arrangements to reset, to readjust, to rearrange our lives so that we can be where God desires for us to be. Oh, my goodness. I need you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that divine arrangements have a purpose. Divine arrangements can show up when you need a promotion. Divine arrangements can show up when you need to be delivered from a situation. It can show up when God opens the door of prosperity and wealth in your life supernaturally. God will even use common and uncommon occurrences to lead and guide us towards his purpose. This is called divine arrangements. It's not by accident. It's not by luck. Things just happen. Oftentimes, it's the invisible hand of God that is manifesting itself in time to bring us to where he needs us to be through divine arrangements. Arrangements. Hallelujah. The Bible says, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and shall say, do not fear, I will help you. Oh my goodness. Divine arrangements. And each and every one of us from time to time experience divine arrangements, but we don't understand. <laughs> Oftentimes we're not aware that it is the hand of God uh, that, 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 that has manifested itself in our lives invisibly to help us accomplish the things and the purpose and the will of God in our lives. And though sometimes it might be difficult. It might be difficult. The Bible says that Saul's name was not strange to Ananias because he had heard about him already. <laughs> He already heard about him. In fact, he told the Lord, said he knew all the evil that Saul had done when it came to the saints at Jerusalem and how he had received authority from the chief priests to arrest everyone that were Christians. And whoever was calling on his name to Ananias, Saul was an enemy of the church. He was an enemy of the church. And he knew Saul was coming to Damascus to actually persecute Christians. And so he had some concerns. The brother had some concerns. Because here he is being told to go to somebody who's a gangster. <laughs> he was a killer. <laughs> He's being told to go to this guy. And if you have not picked it up in the text, Ananias is reluctant when it comes to obeying the Lord. He is reluctant. He is hesitant when it comes to obeying the Lord. He is fearful when it comes to accepting a murderous person like Saul into the church fellowship. Yeah. I would be concerned too. <laughs> I would be concerned too. Because the text is letting us know also that, that Ananias is in no hurry to meet a man who had done terrible things to God's people. Ananias did not want to be Saul's next victim. He, he did not want to be Saul's next victim. That's what he's clearly stating here. He didn't want to be his next victim. And so his hesitation was natural because he knew Saul's reputation already. He knew Saul's reputa reputa reputation already. And so now the question becomes, why would God put Ananias in such an uncomfortable position? Why would God do this to him? Uh, it's not similar uh, to, to what I brought to you earlier when it comes to Cornelius and Peter. Because in that situation, there really isn't any cause for major concerns uh, and, and when I say that, I mean, I'm talking about physical violence and things of that nature. Certainly there are some concerns as it relates to Peter and Gentiles and all of that. That's not the point of my text here. But, but right now, 
uh, I'm asking the question, why would God put Ananias in such an uncomfortable situation? An Ananias, if you don't know, was a devoted, a devoted observer of the law and was highly respected by all those living in that Jewish community. He was well respected. He was minding his, his own business. He was happy with his ministry. He didn't need any more added stress. The brother didn't need any more stress. He was comfortable in staying out of Saul's way. <laughs> he wasn't looking for trouble. He was staying out of Saul's way. So why would the Lord put Ananias in an uncomfortable position? Why is the Lord sending Ananias to Saul and not somebody else is the question. Why couldn't the Lord heal Saul from a distance himself because he had the power to do it? And now I have to dive further down into the text. Let's see if we can find out the purpose and the cause for this mission being assigned to a gentleman by the name of Ananias. Perhaps the Lord was trying to show Ananias the contrast, the contrast, the contrast of Saul's conversion as it relates to his old life and now the new life that he was about to enter into. Maybe Ananias needed to see how the redemptive power of the gospel was able to change a persecutor like Saul into a believer. Perhaps the Lord was using Ananias to help bring Saul into the church so that the mission, the mission of the Gentiles would be approved by the church, would be advanced, would, would grow, would, would further move on. In other words, this was another opportunity for the church to advance and grow, and Ananias' help was now needed in regards to this. Maybe Ananias needed to learn how to love his enemies. Maybe that's just it. <laughs> Maybe Ananias needed to learn how to love his enemies. Turn to the person beside him and say, do you love me? Yeah, I know you're sitting beside your husband, but ask him anyways. Because <laughs> just ask him anyhow. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you love me? Maybe, maybe the Lord was trying to teach Ananias something about learning to love his enemies. Because doesn't the Bible say that we are to love our enemies and do good to those who, who hate you and bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you? Doesn't the Bible say if your enemy is hungry, <laughs> feed him if he's thirsty, give him drink? Doesn't the Bible say uh, do not repay evil with evil? <laughs> Or insult with insult. I mean, you would think, you would think a devoted follower of Jesus Christ would know these things already. You would think a devoted follower like Ananias would be ready to apply these scriptures. It's one thing to know, it's another thing to apply. There's a lot of us in the church that know a whole lot. Shoot. But when it comes to applying what we solidly know, we struggle, we fight, we buck against it. And the Lord is asking, why kickest thou against the bricks? Why kickest against my word? You know it. You know it. But now is an opportunity for you to prove it, to apply what you know. And it's not going to be always easy and comfortable for you to apply what you know. Because you're looking for something comfortable. This brother is not getting a comfortable lesson to apply what he should know. You would think he's ready to go forward in his ministry. <laughs> you would think he'd be ready to go to that next level in his ministry. You would think he'd be anxious having heard from the Lord that this was his time to shine. But as you look at the text, that is not the case. He's dragging his heels. He is dragging his heels. In the text, when you begin to read it, how many times have you been reluctant when it comes to doing what God has asked you to do, especially for someone who you thought didn't deserve it? How many times have God asked you to do something <laughs> that wasn't easy to do, especially for someone who you thought didn't deserve it? I want you to think about that for a little bit. Maybe you are or were reluctant because it was going to take you out of your comfort zone like Ananias. Maybe you were reluctant because you weren't sure of the outcome when God asked you to do something. Maybe you were reluctant because you didn't trust the person who God was using 
to bring about change in your life. Sometimes God will use some strange people. <laughs> Sometimes God will use people that you don't like. People that are completely different than you. People that are more radical than you to bring about the change that he needs to see in you. Oh, some of you are looking at me. It ain't always going to come from out of your household. <laughs> Sometimes God is going to use your boss. Sometimes God is going to use your neighbor to tell you off. Uh, sometimes God is going to use somebody on the highway to hit your car. <laughs> Hello, talk to me. It, it, it ain't always going to be easy when God is trying to work something in you that he sees that you don't see to actually come out. It, it could be a fear of failure, maybe uh, being looked at as failure while you are actually reluctant to do what God is asking you to do. When God calls you into a situation and you're not sure if you're able to do it, that's when the strength of God, that's when the grace of God, my God, will help you in that situation. God is never going to leave you alone in it, no matter how challenging, no matter how uncomfortable, no matter how difficult it might seem. God is going to manifest his strength in that situation. The Bible says that your strength is made perfect. His strength is made perfect in weakness. The problem is, in our text, Ananias was struggling to understand this. <laughs> he was struggling to understand that his strength is being made perfect, or God's strength, rather, is being made perfect in his weakness. And so, as I begin to look at all the options, the possibilities as to why God uh, would put Ananias through this radical situation, this tough and unchallenging situation, a thought came to my mind. Can I share it with you? Turn to the person beside you and say, can pastor share it with us? Here is my thought. I believe the reason why the Lord sent Ananias was because he had an understandable fear of Saul. That's clear in the text. He had an understandable fear of Saul that he also needed to overcome before he could fulfill his assignment. There was an understandable fear that he had of Saul that God needed to deal with before he could move on to his assignment. I need to understand that Ananias' fear and mistrust was getting in the way of what the Lord needed him to actually do. It was interfering with God's plan. It was interfering with his own spiritual growth and maturity, and so God needed to actually remove it. Ananias' hesitation, his reluctancy and fear was actually holding him back when it comes to obeying what God was asking him to do. So not only that it was holding him back, not only was he disobeying God, but it was also hindering what God was trying to accomplish in Saul. Do you see the barriers? Do you see the obstacles that were standing in the way? Sometimes our reluctancy, sometimes our disobedience, Sometimes our unwillingness and hesitation can actually hinder what God is trying to do in the church and also in other people's lives. I need you to understand that God had told Jeremiah that he had appointed him as a prophet to the nations, but Jeremiah was also reluctant. Jeremiah was also unwilling when it came to fulfilling his mission that the Lord had given to him. He did not want the job. God gives him an opportunity. God gives him an assignment. And Jeremiah flat out did not want the job. In fact, he told the Lord that he did not know how to speak and that he was only a child. So he's making all sorts of excuses as to why he did not want the job. And God told him not to be afraid because he would be with him. It's not only Jeremiah that didn't want the job, but Jonah. Jonah, when God called Jonah to preach to the people of Nineveh, he ran away from the Lord. He ran away, was heading to Tarshish instead of fulfilling his actual assignment, his actual mission. Eventually, he was swallowed by a whale. And after some deep, deep, deep reflection, in that belly's whale, 
After some deep reflection, the brother came to his senses. He ended up contemplating and completing his actual assignment. Just like Ananias, Jeremiah, and Jonah had obstacles in their lives that were actually holding them back. And those obstacles needed to be removed. What obstacles is God trying to remove in your life that is preventing you from moving forward? What obstacles is God trying to remove in your life that is preventing you from moving forward? Is it that you have the wrong thought process? Is it that you have the wrong thought process? Is your fears and insecurities creating an illusion in your head that is not true? Every minute you keep telling yourself the same story and building your future around a story that is filled with resentment. It is filled with critiquing and disappointment and pain. Instead of creating a narrative in your mind, instead of creating a narrative in your thought process that is filled with dreams and goals and possibilities and things that matter, you create a narrative based on what you think others are thinking about you. Is the obstacle something that is not real? It could be a person that you never had in the first place, but only fantasized about. Oh, it's quiet now. It's quiet. It could be that you're looking for the perfect woman or the perfect man which doesn't exist. Whatever picture you have in your head, it's going against your present reality. Whatever picture you have in your head that you have created, it is going against your present reality, just like you see with Ananias. He has a picture in his head, but it's going against the present reality of what God is trying to show him. And it's hindering the possibilities that are available. And so whatever it is that you have in your head that's going against your reality, I want you to know that it's hindering the possibilities that are available to you. My goodness. Maybe you don't want to admit that you were wrong about it from the start. Maybe you don't want to admit that it's not what you thought it would be. Maybe you don't want to accept the sense of loss, even though you really never had what you thought you had in the first place. I know I'm getting a little <laughs> into psychology a little bit, but, but I need you to understand, because I had to go there as it relates to Ananias to figure out what's going on with him. Is the obstacle an indecision? Is it an indecision? Perhaps you have lost sight of the much bigger picture. Originally, the goal was to make God first in your life, but now Saul is coming first, and we all have a Saul in our lives. We, have all, we all have a Saul in our lives, whether it's a person, place, or thing. We all have a Saul in our lives, something that is holding us back and, and, and preventing us from doing what God has asked us and called us to do. That Saul is taking precedence over the things of God. My goodness. It's something that keeps competing for your attention. And, and you're feeling lost and confused when it comes time to decide which way you need to go. Maybe you grew up with parents who were overbearing. Parents who were, some of us are in that situation, have been in that situation, you grew up with parents who are overbearing and they, and they didn't give you the opportunity to make your own decisions. They didn't give you the opportunity to make your own decisions, so you never got the chance to fail or succeed. When you were actually growing up, you never had that opportunity, and so now you're counting on other people to make decisions for you, because you never had an opportunity to make your own decisions. And so maybe this is kind of the obstacle that we're seeing in our text. Maybe you're fearful of making the wrong decision and you're constantly going back and forth, struggling to figure out which way should I go, which choice should I make. Hallelujah. I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, before Ananias could go to Saul, God had to remove the obstacle in his life. Are you hearing me, church? <laughs> 
God had to remove the obstacle that was in his life. And the way God removed the obstacle in Ananias was unique. The way he removed the obstacle in Ananias' in Ananias's life was, re, was unique. Because God revealed his actual plan to Ananias. He didn't have to, but he revealed his actual plan to Ananias. God tells Ananias that Saul is a chosen vessel of his to bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The Lord also tells Ananias that he will show Saul the things he would suffer for his name's sake. Did you catch that in the text? Notice once the Lord reveals through revelation what he's about to do for Saul, notice in the text now. Ananias was able to move forward and grow in his ministry by God. And he was now able to go and help Saul fulfill God's plan. God doesn't always remove optical obstacles the same way in our lives. In our text, he's removing it by insight and revelation. But God doesn't always do that with us. God has different ways of removing obstacles in our lives. Case in point, the Bible says that Gideon started out with 32,000 soldiers. Then God told him to tell the men if they were too afraid to fight that they should go home. 20,000 men left that day, leaving Gideon with only 10,000 men. In the end, Gideon was victorious over his enemy, the Midianites, with 10,000 men. So you're seeing that the obstacle that God removed with Gideon is not the same that he moved with Ananias. He didn't use revelation and understanding necessarily when it came to, to, to Gideon here. Here, God dealt with something more tangible. He said to Gideon, go tell the men that if you're afraid to fight, that they should leave, my God. Sometimes in order to produce more, you have to remove more. I need that to sink in. Sometimes in order to remove more, sometimes in order to produce more, you have to remove more. This is what God was showing me in this text. Sometimes in order to produce more, you have to remove more. Let me say it a third time. <laughs> because some of you haven't quite gotten it yet in the spirit. <laughs> Sometimes in order to produce more, you have to remove more. Aristotle, Aristotle, says that there are three kinds of work in our current society and that we only speak of two. The first is theoretical work. This is where theories are developed by researchers to explain phenomena, make connections and predictions. The end goal is truth. The second kind of work is what is called practical work. This has to do with actually taking action. The third kind of work is what is called poesis. Poesis. It refers to bringing forth, as described by philosopher Martin Hilgiger, it's also another way to approach or execute on something. When it comes to achieving certain results, we really take the time to consider which effort would be more advantageous to us and which one actually is not. Would addition or subtraction be more advantageous when it comes to our execution? If we want to sell more insurance, more life insurance, if we want to sell more houses, more heating and cooling systems, we would get more salespeople. If we want to produce more output, then we would increase production. But there is another alternative when it comes to improving results. Instead of looking at how we add more resources to improve our results, we can focus on the obstacles and constraints that needs to be removed. Southwest Airlines implemented a subtraction strategy by offering no frills flight without assigned seating or meal service. Focusing instead on reliable and affordable air travel, Southwest built a loyal customer base that appreciates simplicity and efficiency. This approach, the subtraction strategy, this approach propelled the airline to become one of the largest and most successful carriers in the United States. Oftentimes, when we think of subtraction, this is us, oftentimes, when we think of subtraction, we view it as a negative action. 
we view it as a negative action and addition as a positive action. Our brains are wired to choose addition all the time over subtraction. It is not natural for us to look at subtraction as a positive action, and so oftentimes we overlook it or bypass it. Subtraction is about eliminating what is unnecessary. Subtraction is about eliminating, eliminating what is not necessary. Subtraction is used in the business world oftentimes to enhance. Subtraction is used in the business world oftentimes to develop products. Subtraction is used in the business world oftentimes to make things more efficient, user-friendly, and valuable to customers. Subtra subtraction is what the Lord did with Ananias and Gideon in order for them to produce more. He had to remove more. He had to remove Ananias' fear. He had to remove Ananias' unwillingness and hesitation. And he had to remove the 22,000 men that was hindering Gideon's victory. In order for both men to produce more, the Lord would have to remove more out of their lives. So what area in your life is God removing more of so he can get you to produce more. High five the person beside you now and say, is God subtracting stuff out of your life? Come on, high five them and say, is God subtracting stuff out of their lives? He is removing, he's removing anything that has nothing to do with him. He is removing the distractions in your life so that you can be more focused. Our people in your life, our work situations, our responsibilities in your life more important than God. God, why he has to do the removing. Is he removing more of the dead things, more of the dying things in your life so that your desire for him can increase? You don't hear what I'm saying. Sometimes we're still hanging on to dead things and dead things kill living things. You don't hear what I'm saying. Dead things prevent living things from growing. So oftentimes, in order for God to get you to where he needs to do, in order for them to be some divine arrangement, God often times will subtract. He will remove the things that are dead and dying so that you, your desire, your appetite, so that your thirst for him will increase even further. Is he removing the distractions in your life so that you can be more focused? Yes, there's people that's taking up your time. Yes, there are situations and responsibilities that are taking up your time, but oftentimes those situations, circumstances, and people can be more of a burden than a blessing. And so oftentimes God has to remove and subtract the things that might be good for you but a burden when it comes to you doing the things that he's asked you to do. Are you overly busy doing the things for God instead of doing the things that God needs you to do? Sometimes we can do so much things for God that we're not actually doing it with him. <laughs> Let me say it again. Sometimes, sometimes uh, we can be so busy uh, do money, doing so many things for God uh, that we actually are not doing it with him. And oftentimes God has to get our attention uh, by removing some of those things uh, so, that we can so that he can produce uh, a greater product, a greater outcome uh, when it comes to our lives. Uh, oftentimes to experience more of God, uh, more of his power, uh, and more of his presence in our life, uh, subtraction is necessary. I'm getting ready to go up. I said oftentimes when it comes to having more of God in our lives, more of his power, more of his presence, more of his spirit, subtraction is often necessary. Subtraction is what God did when he washed away our sin. Subtraction is what God did when he removed our guilt and cleansed us from unrighteousness. Subtraction is what God did when he removed the heart of stone ha, that was in us, ha, that heart of stone, ha, and replace it with a fleshly heart. Ha. Subtraction is what God did ha, when he did ha, ha, increase our faith. Ha. Sometimes God has to put us in a situation that will grow our faith, ha, that will challenge us to go higher. Ha. Subtraction is what God will use at times ha, to build and increase our faith. Ha. Subtraction helps us ha, to draw nearer to God.
God. Subtraction helps us to draw closer to God in times of uncertainty. High five somebody beside you and say, is God subtracting anything out of your life so that you can feel more of his power, so that you can experience more of his praise, so you can experience more of his tender love. I heard the psalmist said, the songwriter said, or the writer said, although the fig tree shall not blossom, subtraction, neither shall fruit be in the vine, subtraction, the labor of the olive shall fail, subtraction, and the field shall yield no meat, subtraction, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, subtraction, and there shall not be any herd in the stall, subtraction, yet I will rejoice, yet I will joy in the God of my salvation. Sometimes you have to lose it all to have more of him. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you have to be in the valley so you can have more of his power, more of his presence, more of his spirit. High five somebody and said oftentimes subtraction is necessary when you want to experience more of God. Subtraction is what God does so space can be made available for his presence, for his power, for his spirit to be in your life. Allow God to remove so that he can produce more in your life. High five five people and tell them allow God to remove more so he can produce more in your life. I don't see nobody high fiving nobody. Go to five other people and tell them sometimes God has to remove more so that he can produce more in your life. The Bible says after the Lord allowed the devil to attack Job, you don't hear what I'm saying. The devil attacked Job and Job lost everything. Subtraction, subtraction when it came to his family. Subtraction, subtraction when it came to his livelihood. Subtraction, subtraction when it came to his money. But then the Bible says, so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than the beginning. He gave Job 4,000 more sheep. He gave Job 6,000 more camels. He gave Job 1,000 more oxen. He gave Job 1,000 more donkeys. In all of this, he gave Job seven more sons. He gave Job three more daughters. After Job lost everything, God, God was able to replace greater than what Job had. Isn't God good? I said, isn't God good? Even when God subtracts something from our lives, he will replace it with something better. Let God subtract what he needs to remove out of your life. Don't hold on to it tightly, but let him go. Let him go. Let her go. Because God knows your intended purpose. Even when God subtracts something, he always replaces it with something better. Let him replace it with his goodness. Let him replace it with his kindness. Let him replace it with his wisdom. Whatever God desires to do, let God, let God, allow God, allow God, knowing no good thing when he withhold from them who walk uprightly with him. So go ahead, God, remove what you need to remove so that more can be produced in my life. Go ahead, God, remove the things that are not fitting. Remove the things that are not going to open the door. Remove the things that are not going to take me to the next level. Remove the things that are going to hold me down mentally. Hold me down spiritually. Hold me down physically. Hold me down so I cannot progress, so that I cannot move forward. If you need to lighten my load, go ahead and lighten my load. Light my load. Remove that which is not critical in where I'm going next. If I've got to go to the next level, remove anything that is holding me back. But help me to look to the hills from when cometh my help. Because my help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. 
ask God, allow God to remove more so that he can produce more. Allow God to remove more so that he can produce more. Go to five more people and say, what is God removing? Go to five more people and say, what is God removing? Because whatever God is removing, look in that same spot. Look in that same spot for greater. Look in that same spot for plenty. Whatever area that God is removing, look in that same spot for increase. Look in that same spot for prosperity. Look in that same spot for success because we serve a great, big, awesome, and mighty God. Oh, go ahead and give him a shout of praise. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, give him a shout of praise, and give him a shout of praise. Somebody said, somebody said, I don't know who it is, but somebody said that a diamond only shines once it's been polished. A diamond only shines once it's been polished. And God will use subtraction to polish you. He will use subtraction to polish you. And when he's finished polishing you, you're going to shine, baby. You're going to shine, baby. So let God polish you so that you can shine and come forth as pure, as pure gold. Subtract, subtract, subtract. You might have lost some years. You might have lost some years. You might have lost some time. You might have lost some people. You might have lost some resources. You might have lost some opportunities. But whatever God has subtracted, He's able, he's able to give you the years huh, that the canker worm, huh, the locust, huh, the pomegranate, huh, anything that ate up huh, your resources. Huh, God is able huh, to restore those things. Oh, praise the Lord. Sometimes you will lose more to gain more. I've given you examples in this text. God is not found by adding more and more things to our life. God is not found by adding more and more things to our lives, but by subtraction. <laughs> I've shown you that in the text. That oftentimes he's found by, by subtraction. Sometimes you have to get away from it all. Sometimes you have to go up in the mountains and so you can find it. Sometimes you have to shut in the closet away from, from everything. Sometimes you have to go into fasting. It's through subtraction. <laughs> uh, oftentimes that we, that we find God. And some of us are too busy adding more and more and more and more stuff. To, to our lives trying to fill certain voids that we have in our lives that should have been filled already with Christ. It's not about addition when it comes to God in this season. It's about subtraction. <laughs> it is about subtraction. If I can, if I can get you to understand uh, 
how important it is to learn subtraction again from God's perspective. You will see things a little bit differently and not always work towards addition, 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 addition. That's another sermon that I'll have to put together for you. But, but I'm dealing with subtraction right now. And, and I don't know who God is dealing with in this service. I don't know who God is talking to in this service. I, I don't know. But I know that this message is for someone. God is not going to bring forth this message and not have an intended audience or person for this message. And so if you're here, you know this message is for you. If you're here this morning and things are being subtracted out of your life, one after another, opportunities, positions, health issues, different things are going on, subtraction, you need to be at this altar right now. You need to be at this altar right now. I, I need you to come. Everybody stand. This is where I need to stop and make the altar call. Because you need to allow God to remove more out of your life so he can produce more. You, you, need, you need to allow God to do Stop holding on to stuff that God is telling you to, to let go. You're kicking and screaming <laughs> and fighting. God is hanging on to things tightly while God is trying to get it away from you. It's, it's not about addition, it's about subtraction. I don't know who this message is for, but it's for somebody. If it seems as if more things are being removed out of your life, come. Come. God wants to minister to you. God wants to minister to you. God wants to minister to you. I don't care where you and what you are dealing with currently right now. But you are here for a specific purpose. You, there's a word that God has brought to you this morning that speaks to your situation, that speaks to your circumstance. Do not sit in your seat hearing this word, knowing full well, <laughs> knowing full well that you've been losing some stuff and you're acting like it's okay. You're glossing over the, the things that you have lost. Come and talk to God right now. Come and talk to God this morning. Maybe it's time for you to make a decision. Will you trust God? Or will you be overcome with fear? Will you depend on him? Or are you making excuses? Why are you being reluctant? Why are you hesitant? Why are you dragging your heels? When it comes to what God is trying to do, you know what you need to do, and God knows what you need to do, but you're not doing it. If you're not saved, you need to be at this altar. Subtraction is God's way of dealing with you. <laughs> subtraction is God's way of dealing with you. If you haven't fully given your life over to Jesus Christ, sub subtraction is God's way of dealing with you to let you know that you need to put him first in your life and not all the other things that you're putting first in your life. Who, who is God speaking to this morning? This message is for you. I know there's at least several of you here this morning that needs to be at this altar. I don't care if you've been in church for 10, 15 years. Sometimes we're still holding on to things that we need to let go. Sometimes we're still wrestling with things because traditionally, <laughs> traditionally it helped us in the past, but not in this new season. Hallelujah. Church, let's pray. There's a fight at the altar. There's a fight in the spiritual realm right now. God is speaking to folks. And there's a hesitancy. There is a reluctancy. Just like Ananias, there is a reluctancy to move. And God is looking to replace some things. God is looking to remove some things. And we need to allow God to do that this morning. I don't know if there's sin in your life. I don't know if there's some people in your life. But I know you need to come and talk to God right now. I know you need to come and talk to God right now. I don't know whatever it is you're upset about because you thought you should have it and you don't, you don't have it. You lost it. You need to come talk to God right now. There's a disruption that's going on in your life right now. And you don't like the disruption that's taking place in your life right now. You're uneasy. You're unstable with that disruption because you sense a loss. And it might be a loss over something that you probably never had, but you thought you had. Shabbat. Come to God right now. 
come to God right now in order to deal with the outcome. Come to God right now. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for you. If you have a need right now this morning, the altar is open for you to come. The altar is open for you to come right now. Come right now. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe it's some people in your life that you have lost. Maybe it's a friend, a family member. Maybe it's an opportunity that you thought once would be an open door for you and that opportunity is no longer available to you. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Praise team, you can come this morning. I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for you to come. No, nobody should even push you or prompt you. <laughs> nobody should even push you or prompt you to come to this altar. No, nobody should push you or prompt you. God is waiting on you. God is waiting on you. Whatever it is that you have lost, it's God is allowing it to drive you to find him. To find him. To, to, to have more of him. It's pushing and propelling you to have more of him and, and less of the thing that you're focused on. Because that thing you're focusing on right now is taking too much of God's time. That thing that you're focusing on right now is causing you to be unavailable. That thing that you're focusing on right now is causing you to be lukewarm. It's causing you to be lukewarm. That thing that you're focusing right on right now, you have to wait on it in order for you to make a decision. Hey, Kobo Hosa. You have to wait on it in order to make a decision. That's not God's thing. That's not God's thing. Can, can, can you leave that thing alone and trust God? What is for you is for you. <laughs> what is for you is for you. And as painful as it is, as unbearable as it might be, as excruciating as it might be, you need to let God remove it. You need to let the ministry of subtraction work in your life right now. Instead of counting on the things you've lost, count on the things that you stand to gain. Oh. On the things you stand to gain. Who needs to be at this altar right now? This is a mental warfare. <laughs> this is a mental warfare because some of us are looking on the things. Looking on the things that are seen. As opposed to the things that are not seen. Come to this altar right now. Who else needs to be at this altar? We need some of our directors, we need some of Aaron's army to come and lay hands on some of those that are at this altar right now. Come right now. Hallelujah. I appreciate those that are at the altar reaching out right now. I appreciate those that are at the altar right now. I don't want them to be at the altar by themselves. I don't want them to be at the altar by themselves. Come and lay hands on somebody. Come and lay hands on somebody. Aaron's army, come and lay hands on somebody. There's an internal struggle going on because sometimes we're more concerned about what others think than what God thinks. And, and this morning, this morning, God is not concerned about what others think. He's more concerned about what you are thinking right now. Why he's calling you to this altar. To surrender your life to him. To give your life to him today. What is it that you need to subtract out of your life so you can have more of God? So you can have more of his presence, more of his power, more of his spirit. You know what that one thing is. Come to this altar right now. Maybe you need to tap into it again. Maybe you need to grab hold of it again. 
Maybe you need to release yourself so you can have more of him and less of you. Who else needs to be at this altar? Is there anybody here that knows that they need to be saved? They need to surrender. 